Slow down a little bit. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> a little flustered from, from kind of thinking. I understand. There we go. Um, and so as a result, people try to carry around smaller and smaller things because you really didn't want to carry everything with you. So people carry around like precious metals like gold or silver. And of course, that's still a little bit of a pain those things weigh a fair amount. So people started carrying around paper money, right? Which is redeemable for gold or silver if you went to a bank or a government or whoever was running these. But that's still a little inconvenient because you have to carry around all this money in your wallet. So how do you carry around the minimal thing? And one of the ways to do this is to digitize money. And there's sort of two ways to do this. You can try to make digital cash, which is a digital analog of cash, and so it's, it's actually anonymous and it's difficult to counterfeit. And this is in fact quite hard to do, is making digital goods that you can't copy is not even possible. If you think about how easy it is for a 14-year-old kid to pirate the latest Justin Bieber album, you can say that the $20 bill is probably worth considerably more than Justin Bieber, if somebody can get about the of the scope of problem. So, in practice, people want to do that. Instead, they do digital cash, with, uh, digital checks, excuse me, which we are all familiar with. This is how debit cards work. You go to the grocery store, you swipe your card, and the money is taken from your account and put into the uh, grocery store's account. And this is quite convenient, but maybe for this convenience, we pay no price and we make you higher price. What do you lose? And the answer is, in fact, that we lost privacy. Because in this system, the bank sees everything you do. Right? They see who you do it, when you do it, and how much, and when. And they remember that forever. The banks are sort of like elephants. This doesn't go away. Almost as significantly, the merchants who do your work now see what you do. They get to trace every single interaction you have with them even if you don't see the same cashier or go to the same store. And this is sort of a problem. If you think about it, people will go to fairly long lengths to avoid this kind of tracking online. They disable cookies, they use no script, some people even use toys. And yet, we have this thing in you know, real life that is tracking you about that way. Oh, sorry. And so the question then is, maybe we should have revisited this digital cash. In fact, a bunch of academics did in the 80s and, and more recently. And the result basically is you can't make uncommonable digital goods, but you can make single use ones. So the idea here is, is if you get a coin from a bank, that coin has a serial number on it. And you can make as many copies of it as you want, but it still has to have that serial number on it, because that's what the bank is signed. And then you spend that coin, you give it to the merchant, and they check with the bank. The that zero is unspent. And so the second copy that we make is useless, as is the thousand that as is the number. You can only use it once. So this is how we get the uncopyable part of the work. But how do we get that in the numbers, right? Zero numbers are traceable. And so that doesn't really get us in the right things. And so the breakthrough that was done originally in 1982 by someone named David Chong was to use what are known as blind signatures which basically allow the bank to, instead of signing a serial number on a coin, to sign a opaque envelope containing a serial number. So the idea here is all the envelopes are the same, and so the bank will give you one of these with a serial number, or they'll give the bank one of them, and they'll sign it and give it back. And then if you spin it, you will hand the envelope to the merchant, and the merchant will make sure the signature is valid, and then open the envelope, take out the serial number, and check that it's not valid spent, and then report it on the list of spent ones. This is random because the bank has no idea which one you just came from because they've never seen a serial number. And so this is actually quite practical. This gives us privacy and this has been extremely biological work. 
But of course, none of this stuff's really took off. How many of you have here have heard of the GCash? How many of you ever used it? Oh, that's way more people than I expected. But the point is, nonetheless, they didn't really see any widespread adoption. And the reason we'll see in a second, if you consider what you actually want from a digital currency system, you want it to be secure. This is the same point I'm so to speak. If your system can have money counterfeited or stolen, it is, of course, a punchline. It's not a currency system. As we just saw, you would really like it to be private. But the more important feature I think in terms of getting these things adopted is that you'd like it to be decentralized. Right? Because if you have to convince people that to use their system, they either have to trust some bank who, by the way, who else wants to convince you to use your currency? That's really hard. Or they have to trust some company who you started to do this, like Digicash. You're probably not going to succeed. But if you have a distributed system, you can just sort of set it up, build it, and they will come. And in fact, this is you know, what happened with Bitcoin. I'm going to assume, I'm not going to talk about it on Monday or Tuesday, but you guys are all familiar with Bitcoin, and I don't need anyone in the background. Uh, I certainly hope so. But I would just point out that Bitcoin has a transaction log called blockchain, which has everyone's transaction in it, and these are uh, public. Um, this is actually a useful feature for what we do on top of it, but it's also the most great case for it. Because if you look at how Bitcoin adds up, stacks up as a currency, ideally, that is clearly decentralized, it is pretty clearly secure. But is it private? That's sort of an open question, right? So let me stop for a second and give you a little digression, right? When people say privacy in terms of Bitcoin, they usually talk about anonymity. A lot of press things I've read say Bitcoin is anonymous. And so anonymity as a technical thing means if you think about like knowing someone's name, if I'm trying to guess your name and you say it's anonymous, then you could have any name of all the six million some odd people on the planet. I know nothing about you. On the other hand, if we know that you might have one of a possible smaller subset of names, you can go to like the grocery store between you John one day and go to somewhere else in between, between you and Jack another day. If we say that you don't have anonymity, you have pseudonym, because you're known to people as a different set of finite pseudonyms. And the problem with pseudonymity is that it's actually somewhat easy to link pseudonyms together. Maybe the two different uh, stores you were going to notice that you drove home to the same house, and now they know that they probably belong to the same person. Maybe somehow you just found out that Samuel Clemens and Mark Twain are the same person. Right? And so this is the problem that Bitcoin has. Because Bitcoin's transaction store is public. But of course, it's not, it doesn't have a name associated with it. It has public keys you can have. You can have as many of them as you want. But linking those public keys together it turns out to not be that hard. And there's a lot of sort of techniques you can leverage from, from computer science. Right? I'm actually a PhD student uh, in corporate academia. Or there are a lot of techniques you can leverage from there to actually end up with uh, identifying information about people. And so it's an interesting question, right? Are these techniques that people have done in data mining and graph theory applicable to Bitcoin? And the answer is yes. And in fact, the preliminary results people have looked at are not really that good. And I must emphasize these are preliminary results. The people who mainly looked at this were cryptographers sort of got on everyone's academic radar about a year, a year and a half ago. And photographers are very good at doing photography and security, but they're not domain experts in data. Really. And so the results they got are not going to be as good as the results of people who do this uh, as their main thing. And so when those people start looking at this, these results will be even better from the academic point of view, or worse if you actually care about privacy. Right? So significantly, all these, these papers, to the best of my knowledge, are passed. People are just downloading the blockchain and looking at it. They are not trying to insert things into the blockchain that they might use in the academy. That is, of course, a more powerful class of things that you can investigate. And so the reality of that is that we have to sort of assume, based on this kind of stuff, that Bitcoin, in terms of as it is, is not really private. In fact, it's, it's definitely worse than cash, because cash is anonymous. I think it's actually worse than the bank, because at least in the case of the bank, it was the bank and whoever they told that you were stuck. Your neighbors did, your family did, your co-workers did. Unless, of course, you work at a bank and they have bad security stuff, but that's a side point. So, in fact, with Bitcoin, it's worse than this. All your information is known to everyone. 